It's that time of year Load up my gun Put on my gear Welcome back to the Healthy Hunter Show. I'm Dr. Brooks Tiller, and today I'm pumped because I have an award-winning adventure filmmaker, a wildlife steward and conservationist here with us. He's got over 20 years of award-winning, I said award-winning, film production experience. And if you've seen any outdoor television or commercial from hunting to snowboarding to trucks, you've most likely seen some of his work. He is on the forefront of conservation and he's more than just a talk about it kind of guy. He's a walk it and live it the hard way. So today, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to ruffle some feathers. And I know my guest today is not either. We're going to speak the truth and talk real. He is a passionate man. And I really look up to him in several ways as a filmmaker, as a steward for wildlife, as a conservationist, and probably most importantly, as a devoted husband and a father. It is my pleasure today to welcome Mr. Tom Oprey to the Healthy Hunter Show. Thanks for coming on, Tom. Oh, man, it's a, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here with you. I'm glad to see uh, seeing everybody out there listen to the Healthy Hunter podcast because uh, if we're not healthy, folks, we can't spend time on that great outdoors that the Lord brought to all of us. And, uh, you know, we're really blessed to have the opportunities we have. And as you mentioned, uh, I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm getting a little more along in the tooth. Uh, we're now over 30 years doing this stuff. So I've uh, been a gun for hire for a long time. And, uh, and now we're kind of changing gears a little bit, moving more into uh, uh, trying to do something that's going to change the world, hopefully for the better long term. So, um, but yeah, it's, 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 this COVID thing's got everything screwed up and uh, we're just like everybody else trying to figure out which way is going up, even out here in Montana. So, but uh, you had some questions for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the first thing I want to say is just, you, you, like you said, the COVID thing is really, has us all kind of up in arms and we don't know what, you know, we're not sure what's going on and it's got things kind of screwy for us, but we can always find the good. And I just want to start off with what's going good in your world right now. Well, you know, uh, probably the biggest thing, as I was alluding to just a second ago, was um, I've been a hired gun, which means, as you mentioned earlier, I've, I've directed and, and filmed and produced TV commercials to to feature films, to Shark Week for Discovery Channel, to, you know, I mean, if you've seen anything with Warren Winches on it, uh, videos and stuff for the last 13, 14 years, I've done all their work. Uh, of course, uh, you know, I've done outdoor television to outdoor TV commercials for all the different product companies uh, from firearms to ammunition to optics and a whole bunch of stuff in between. So we've been really, really blessed. Uh, but, you know, I, I've got a lot of great friends that are also outdoor filmmakers, uh, wildlife photographers, and, uh, you know, all of us spend a lot of time out, out there in the wilderness and out there in nature, and, and we really have this intimate relationship with nature, and because we're out there doing all this photography and filmmaking, and we see the impact man has on the world, not only just the different worlds, uh, the world wildlife populations, uh, but also habitat. We're seeing it here in North America, we're seeing it in Africa, we're seeing it in Asia, because uh, we've been blessed to go all over the place. And uh, so a bunch of us got together and we formed a nonprofit called the Shepherds of Wildlife Society. And really at its core is our, our, our there's filmmakers and photographers that have that relationship. And because we see what's going on, we also see that there's a huge disconnect with modern society when it comes to nature. Uh, people don't even know where their food comes from. Uh, as hunters, you know, hunters know where their food comes from. Fishermen know where their food comes from. Uh, but most people, I mean, I think they did a survey two years ago in Chicago in the public school system there in their high school and 47% of high schoolers didn't know that their burger came from a, from an animal, from a cow. And so, you know, we get this huge disconnect and, and these are people when they get up in the morning, you know, they flip a switch, they expect the lights to come on. They don't know where electricity comes from. You know, they walk into the bathroom, flush the toilet out of sight, out of mind. You know, they don't want to deal with it. I get it. The next big decision of the day is the chai latte or caramel macchiato. And, you know, the guys I'm working with, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> much better filmmakers and, and photographers than I am, but I've been really blessed to get together with these guys. And I mean, they are going all over the world seeing things that are happening that are really, really bad for wildlife and wildlife habitat. And, and so we formed this nonprofit to basically reconnect modern society with nature, to try to get those people to understand how important it is to be uh, constructive and uh, progressive conservationist. And the word conservation to me, 
uh, I, I asked a, a British chap of mine, I said, what does conservation mean? He goes, well, it means to conserve. And I said, well, okay, so what does that mean? He says, well, you know, we've got to leave these things alone. I said, no, you're saying preserve, not conserve. I said, because conservation, when it comes to, you know, in my definition, it basically means, uh, you know, the wise use of a natural resource. And if you want to debate this with me, and I'll say, okay, well, what happens in Tempe, Arizona, or Phoenix, or L.A. when they run out of water, drinking water? The government tells everybody that lives there to practice wise water, what? Conservation. So we conserve water, we, <laughs> frontiersmen conserve tea and salt and sugar. Um, you know, we do the same thing with wildlife, which means the wise use of that wildlife. And the North American conservation model, uh, which Teddy Roosevelt championed back in the late 18 or you know, turn of the century, uh, is really uh, the most successful wildlife conservation model that we've ever seen in human history. And, uh, you know, it came out of this human steamroller of European settlement across North America. And now we have some of the highest populations of, of certain species of, of game animals and non-game animals. Because for every time we go out there and put an effort in as, as, as sportsmen to protect that wildlife resource and to enhance it and conserve it and manage it through science, uh, we're affecting not only those animals that are harvested for people to put on their table, but also all the non-game species that live there. I mean, we literally affect everything in an ecosystem basis. And that's what's so incredible about the North American model. That's so true. And, you know, it's that circle of life and things that even, like you said, we don't hunt are there. And, you know, just people that talk about their, their food plots. And one of the best things, the, you know, that whenever you're looking at fertile ground, the earthworms. And if there's good, if you have a lot of worms, you have good, you most likely have good dirt, you have good plants growing, and then the wildlife flourishes and you have that circle of life. And, and also you talk about how we are so disconnected and, you know, we have that Disney mentality of that animals have human traits and that sort of thing. And that's so far-fetched to me growing up in the, in the woods and knowing what happens and, and that's just one of those things I think that we see on a daily basis. I even saw where uh, around here, we don't watch a lot of television, but normally if it is, it's an outdoor Bear Grylls something. And Bear Grylls had David Batista, the, the movie star, former wrestler, and big solid dude. And he was just like, dude, I am not an outdoorsman. I grew up in the city. And they were having to kill a fish to eat it. And he just looked at the camera and he said, I... I like to think about my food coming from a grocery store, not from an animal, even though he, he said he knew that where it comes from. And it's just interesting that so many people are not, not aware, like you said, of just where our food comes from and, well, and, 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 and what's going on. Yeah. And, and, and what the problem is, is that you have a scenario that's developed, especially you mentioned Disney. I mean, Walt Disney, I mean, was a great entertainer. He obviously built a great company, the foundation for a great company. But if you've ever seen the evolution of Mickey Mouse, when Mickey Mouse first came out in cartoons, he had a, a long nose and little beady eyes and little ears. Well, it, it's, it's actually been studied that over the decades, Disney eventually took a model of, uh, of human psychology and redesigned Mickey to look more like a human baby. Big eyes, big ears. And so, and that was in order to be more acceptable of this animal because, I mean, that, I mean I've, had a, I've got a great vet friend that uh, she was telling me about uh, her thoughts on, you know, how this kind of process happened. You know, prior to like late 80s, 1990s, most of us didn't have the dog in the house. You know, I, because we had fleas. Dogs carried fleas. Fleas carried disease. Nobody wanted to be picking fleas off themselves sitting on the couch watching TV. So with the advent of flea callers, this gal seems to think that that kind of helps usher in a little bit more of this, this disnification of wildlife. And of course, you know, Hollywood studios have propagated this myth that, you know, animals are just an extension of humanity. Well, that's not the reality, but because we have this huge disconnect that's developed here, and especially as you mentioned on the food stuff, you know, I, I like to ask people in presentations, I'm like, how many of you people have ever bought a happy meal at McDonald's. And everybody, you know, everybody raises their hand, right? You know, you got a kid, you bought a happy meal. I mean, how you know kids stop you from driving by? No, we're not going to Burger King, we're getting a happy meal. Well, let me clue you into something. There's nothing happy 
about a happy meal. It doesn't matter. You understand? There's nothing happy about a happy meal. It doesn't matter if you got the cheeseburger or the chicken nuggets. You paid someone to kill an animal to feed your kid, which that's perfectly fine because without the death of billions of animals on this planet, humanity ceases to exist. And that's one of the wonderful things about the North American sportsmen, that hunter and fisherman, you know, our families and our kids that are getting outdoors, you know, hunting and, and that tradition that we have historically had surrounding those outdoor activities is, is really important to the foundations of our families and our society because the people that do these things have a different mindset. You know, one, they respect firearms, they respect other people. Um, not, you know, there's always bad apples in every bushel, but you know, for the most part, these people care about themselves, their health, uh, you know, their stamina. You see these people that will spend lots of time in their own personal funds on conservation, becoming parts of, of, uh, of wildlife conservation groups like Wild Sheep Foundation to Turkey Federation to, uh, you know, mule deer. And, and I mean, there's just, there's a, a plethora of wildlife conservation groups where people are volunteering their time and their hard-earned money in order to see a change, to see wildlife propagate, to see that that habitat is, is protected from uh, development and that the animals have a place to live. Because really, that's our planet. That's where we live. We're part of that circle of life. And if we don't take care of this, I mean, I'll admit I was an Eagle Scout. And my father and in the, in the Eagle Scout, the whole process you go through in scouting, they pretty well taught and ingrained in my head, leave things better than the way you found them. And that's really kind of what's propagated what I'm doing moving forward is, is just gathering up all those like-minded people and saying, you know what? There's seven and a half billion people on the planet. We're seeing the destruction of wildlife habitat and, and, and the wildlife populations around the world, including here in North America. But if we don't do something about it, because of this disconnect where people don't even know where their food comes from, they, don't, they, they think that hunters are terrible people, a bunch of Elmer Fudds going out, you know, a bunch of Elmer Fudds raising more rascally rabbits to go out and shoot and kill. These same people there, and I'm not talking about anti-hunters here, or animal welfare people. I'm talking about that broader public that really don't care about people hunting or the consumption of wildlife and fisheries, as long as it's done for the right reasons. And, you know, in today, and let's get brutally honest, the hunting community, the hunting industry is kind of morphed. And in my life, I've watched it go from what I call more of a uh, biocentric approach to hunting. We talked about, you know, the relationships and traditions of, that families and people had through hunting. Uh, you know, we hunted for food, obviously we, we hunted for tools and clothing and all that. And of course, we don't have to do that in the modern age. But what I've watched over the last several decades is this morphing of hunting, at least the way it's portrayed to the broader public, is that it's more what I call an egocentric approach to hunting. It's about tape measures and chest pumps and, and uh, record books and booners and, you know, because that is what the hunting community displays out on social media, the grip and grin pictures. I got news for you. If you've gone off to Africa and spent 80 or $100,000 shooting a lion, that's great because it's created a tremendous amount of conservation value for that species. And it affects all the other species in an ecosystem because it pays for so many different things. So game scouts and biologists and people to work in those communities so they understand that the value of that wildlife exists. So they don't want to kill it when it comes into their garden. You know, but what we see here because of that disconnect is, uh, you know, people saying, oh, well, you know, when you're holding that dead, eye, you know, dead lion in your hands and, and maybe it's got some blood on it and you got a big grin on your face, the same thing goes for deer or turkey or anything else. Because of that disconnect, these people don't understand. You look no different than ISIS holding up somebody's human head cut off that we've seen on YouTube back when ISIS was, was running Syria and, and uh, Iraq back there over the last decade. So I think as hunters, we have to understand, all hunters have to understand that we're only a very small portion of our society. Historically, it's always been that way. And people say, well, we've got to have a whole bunch more hunters. No, we just have to recruit hunters to replace the ones we have because let's go back a thousand years and you got a village of a hundred people. Well, a hundred people didn't go hunting. Um, 50 of them were women. And again, if it's a matriarch or patriarch society, it's usually patriarch, so the hunters were usually men and 50 of them weren't very good at it. So probably only eight, 10 or 12 or 15 of them actually did most of the hunting. 
And whereas other people had other skills that they were good at, they were making moccasins or tools or wigwams or whatever, or teepees, whatever the situation is. But because we have this disconnect, we live in a society with, you know, only based on U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service data, I mean, I think only about five or six percent of the population in any, any given year here over the last 10 years buys a hunting license. So when we live in a representative democracy where elections are decided by 50 percent plus one vote, that means people that are concerned about hunting issues or issues around wildlife conservation that have to do with hunting literally are in a circumstance where you're already 45 percent plus one vote behind before you even start the election so that perception of hunting um, has to change the other nefarious factor we have on this is what i call the antichrist of wildlife conservation that's your animal rights groups your anti and i don't mean your dog or you know the puppy mill stuff i'm talking about the hardcore anti-hunting groups, the Humane Society of the United States, the Center for Biological Diversity. There's a long litany of them, uh, PETA. These people, ask, go look on their, their tax forms, which are all published on in the US uh, IRS uh, website. You can actually look up every single nonprofit's 990 tax form. And you can see how much money they spend on conservation. On the ground, boots on the ground, money on the ground, making sure that wildlife and, and, and the habitat that sustains wild animals is going to be healthy and exist in perpetuity. And you know what that number is? It's zero. So the reality there is we have to figure out how these folks, you know, how we get the people that are going to vote in elections and the people they're going to write, you know, check every month for the price of a cup of coffee and send it to PETA, the Humane Society of the United States. We've got to figure out how to educate those people because if we don't educate them, they're the ones that are going to vote to ban and, and regulate hunting out of existence. And we've already seen that throughout North America, throughout the world. We, you know, there's a, there's a legislation right now in the UK to ban the importation of animal parts into their country. Uh, we saw it in British Columbia where grizzly bears, uh, you know, trophy grizzly bears were going to be banned at hunting of them uh, by the liberal government that was running for office there. We've seen it in Maryland where uh, governor, Democrat governor ran saying, if you vote for me, I'm going to ban black bear hunting. Well, folks, if we're truly going to be wildlife conservationists, I don't care what you think about hunting or, you know, whether good, bad, or indifferent, but we do have to admit the North American conservation model is the most successful model ever to occur. It's why we have all this wildlife here in North America and why other parts of the world that accepted different, you know, and utilize different parts of that model have also seen success is because we care about that resource. We spend time with it. We invest in it, and that's your hunters, that's your fishermen. Those are the people that spend time outdoors, recreating. And because of that, and because of the money that they pay for, you know, remember hunters pay billions of dollars every year between hunter license fees in the states and provinces and the Pittman-Robertson Act, which is a federal excise tax that was initiated in 1934. A little over 11% of every single gun, every single bullet, every single cartridge, every single bow, every single arrow, every single... Uh, field point, anything that's purchased in those in that in that world right there is taxed, and that federal money goes directly to the U.S. or actually goes to the Department of Interior, doesn't go to the IRS, and then gets distributed amongst all 50 states fish and game departments. And so we have to make sure that the rest of those 45 percent plus one understand how important this model is and if we're and what it's accomplished over the years and what the future can hold because the greatest threat to wildlife today is, is, is not hunting it's not even the poaching we hear about incessantly on the news media about you know rhino horn or, or even elephant ivory uh, or even the poaching of a big elk or something like that the biggest problem wildlife has today is you and i it's all of this humanity this you know the seven and a half billion people i mentioned because in order to have society function you know so that we, we're not killing each other people have to be fed and if you don't have food in your belly i mean we're going through this COVID thing you know we've all been talking about there where's the next paycheck going to come from well if we don't have a way to put money in our pockets and, and buy food then uh and get that food then we're going to have problems so the reality is is it, we need to grow grow more food got to make more food so what happens slash and burn habitat no matter where you are in the world no matter here in the united states or anywhere else and uh, when that habitat's gone, then there's no, there's no animals living in it because it's overgrazed by domestic stock. And a lot of times these, these areas that are being slashed and burned have substandard soils. And you talked about the soils and, and earthworms. Uh, I, I've worked a lot with some of the top research scientists and wildlife biologists in the world over the years. 
And uh, one fellow, Dr. Valerius Geis from British Columbia, flat out says, you know, the only thing that allows humanity to exist today is one thing, and it's soil. It's the soil of the earth. That is the basic foundation for all living humans on this planet, because everything in that circle of life comes right from the soil. Hey, we come from the soil. You know, so I mean, it's just the reality is, is that, uh, you know, we have to do a much better job of educating those people that are in the middle. So what I'm doing besides, you know, creating this nonprofit is uh, we're my my background, as you, you mentioned, everybody is filmmaker. Uh, so we started to, to produce very high end, serious, mainstream documentary films. And I just spent the last three and a half, four years. Uh, spending time going back and forth to Zambia, uh, telling, the, uh, documenting the story of a, a, a very impoverished people, uh, a remote uh, community uh, led by a woman chief who dared to break the cycle of, of, um, of poverty and uh, through running a, a bush war against poaching. And so this film is, uh, it's, a, it's a feature length film, you know, it's an hour and 20 minutes long. And uh, we're just now going through the whole process of submitting it to close to 100 film festivals all over the world, because our mission is to, is to reconnect modern society with nature. And this film tells you about the nitty gritty, the hard truth of what's going on. And, uh, and it's a real emotional film. I mean, it's, it's not a film about conservation. It's not a film about hunting. Yeah, it deals with those things, but it's truly a film about basic human rights. You know, so. You know, that's something we're doing. We've just, been, we've already got, I think there are eight film festivals that looked at it, three have already accepted it. And uh, we've got about, like I said, 90 more to go. So um, it's gonna be a very, very busy 2021 for what we're trying to do as far as getting the word out. And the nice thing too about that, folks, is uh, being able to, to talk to the media. It opens up doors so that we can have the same conversation you and I are having right now on this podcast with people that are truly disconnected. You know, you were talking about Bear Grylls with, uh, with this uh, you know, uh, movie star guy he's out there with and wrestler and whatnot. You know, I mean, the reality is, is that's all, every one of us, every sportsman, every sportswoman needs to go out and talk to people. Uh, talk to those people that aren't, that don't understand why people hunt, don't understand the North American hunt. Bring some game meat, give it to people that have never had it before. That's the greatest way to open a door with someone. Uh, and it's a great way to be a good neighbor too. So. You know, that's so in the big picture, that's what we're working on right now. And we're also going to be building out a bunch of educational uh, curriculum and some materials where we can actually target uh, various decision makers like politicians and lobbyists to uh, the media. And a uh, you know, matter of fact, last Friday, we, uh, we had a private screening of the film. It's called Killing the Shepherd. Uh, and we had a private screening uh, virtually with uh, most of the upper leadership of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and now I've got a couple of U.S. congressmen that would like to do the same thing for the entire Natural Resources Committee of the U.S. Congress. It won't happen until we get through some of this COVID stuff, probably, and, and uh, that's going on right now, and the new, the new president elected and all that. So, but, um, you know, it's exciting stuff, um, but it's stuff that, like I said, I, we, it's time to, to have an effect that will be a lasting change because... Uh, if we don't get these people you know, thinking right about why we hunt and why we manage wildlife through sustainable utilization, um, we're never gonna, we're gonna lose it all. And we're not only gonna lose our opportunities to go out there in the outdoors and, and, and harvest game, but uh, the wildlife is gonna be gone too. And when the, when the habitat's gone, nobody's gonna sit around and argue about whether the, the game animals are, can be shot or not, because it's just not gonna exist. Yeah, I mean, and, and you mentioned like the 5% that hunt and then you might have say that five to ten percent that is just anti-hunting and it really is that middle those middle folks that they, they could they're like oh, if you hunt you hunt it's fine you know i don't and that's kind of their attitude and they could really care less either way and and through this covid stuff like you're talking about sharing that meat i we were blessed enough that we have a freezer or two full of deer and elk and turkey and squirrels and rabbits and whatever else that we've been able to hunt fish and we had friends that would either you know come over or we would hey they're like man like i can only find a pound of beef at the store and i was like well hey here's here's a couple pounds of ground deer you know make spaghetti make chili whatever and and that really triggered a lot of and some of these folks are living in the city never hunted never held a gun before and that triggered a lot of, of interest in them. Like, hey, 
could you teach me how to hunt? And so we've started down that path of, of trying to share it with them. Here's how you get into hunting and, you know, they'll, you know, taking them out and letting them shoot a bow, let them shoot a shotgun, let them shoot a little bit and learn a little bit. I think that's one thing as, as outdoorsmen we can do to help just our neighbor. And, uh, it, but I think for me, uh, before I really got in meeting you and dove into what you're doing, I think that whole of this, this privilege, this right, if you will, to hunt, I, I always just took it for granted. Hold, and, hold on, hold, hold on a second there though. Yeah. Hunting is not a right. You right. show up where in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights that you have a right to hunt. You have a right to the Second Amendment. I mean, the Second Amendment, the right to, to possess a, uh, a firearm. And that is the crux. That is the basis for the North American conservation model. I mean, uh, Dr. Geist, in interviewing him uh, last year, he explained that with the fall of communism, many people in Russia wanted to embrace the North American conservation model. Um, of course, they had to fight against the Oglivars. And those guys that had all the you know billions of dollars ended up winning this this war because everybody wanted to have a gun. They wanted to make it legal. Wanted to have a Second Amendment in in uh, in Russia. Now the byproduct of that is, and we're seeing it in certain parts of Canada now, is because of management. But there in, in Russia and Siberia, there's what they call wildlife deserts. There's entire huge thousands of acres or thousands of square miles of nothing but very limited large game animals there because what happens is if you don't manage these wildlife because you know, historically man has always man i mean all of north america has been terraformed by humans you know everything's been burned everything's been adjusted all of the 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 uh, nut trees on the eastern seaboard of the united states those were all cultivated by early you know populations of humans living on the eastern seaboard before they were all killed off mostly by you know disease from conquistadors and, and European uh, settlement. But the reality there is that in, in Russia, you know, you, you get a situation where um, there's no management of any of the predators. So, and so if the humans are no longer managing them, or you don't have mega predators from like 10,000 years ago, you know, saber tooth tigers and whatever else, and cave bears and all stuff, going after other predators, what we what we see based on the research that, that I'm hearing from these scientists is that the wildlife populations dwindle. So the prey species dwindle, get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the only things that survive are those few animals that can handle the winters and handle the predators. So they're like huge mega animals, like uh, the Chadwick uh, ram, that, which is the world record stone sheep, stone sheep from British Columbia, was came from an area that is considered a wildlife desert. There's almost no wildlife there because it has got had predators. So the predators kill everything. Well, eventually there's not enough food for even the wolves. So the wolves eventually die out. What is the last thing that, la that will be in that, in that wildlife desert? Well, it will be a few prey animals like I talked about, very few ones that can survive everything they're going through there, but also the bears. The bears are omnivores. They can survive without the prey species there because they can eat veg vegetable matter. And that's because that's where they're set up. So we end up in these wildlife deserts is nothing but a bunch of bears and a few pockets of, of prey animals. And that's all that's there. So you lose your biodiversity. And that's occurring in different places in, in, uh, in British Columbia right now, in the Yukon, that's happened throughout Siberia. So, you know, it's, it's when you talk about trying to get all these people into this whole story of, you know, well, we'll talk about the right. I mean, again, it's, it's a privilege. I guess I should finish that. Hunting is a privilege, and because it's a privilege, we need to take responsibility. And one of the things that I put together a few years ago was I, I firmly believe there needs to be an ethics reset in modern hunting. Technology has changed so many things. I mean, it, it, even so much as talking about posting on social media. Um, so I wrote The Principles of Modern Ethical Hunter, and I'm happy to share that with anybody, or you can go to our website, shepherdsofwildlife.org, and, and uh, you can get it and download it. It's meant to, it's not a Bible, it's not a commandment, it's just meant to elicit conversation. And, uh, you know, we're, like we said, the nitty gritty here is that we have a whole bunch of people that don't understand where their food comes from, let alone why we spend time in the outdoors pursuing game animals. Um, plus, they're willing to vote for politicians that are willing to ban your hunting. And, and I'll add that, if you ban hunting for a certain species or a certain technique or whatever that is, or a certain area, 
how do wildlife managers manage the ecosystem when they only have little bits and pieces that they actually have any kind of control over? They don't. You know, this whole idea that uh, God's going to, you know, ma Mother Nature is going to make all this great and take care of it and stuff. Dr. Geist flat out says, you know, that God never has and never will. You know, it's been humanity that has this, this footprint over the entire world. I mean, it's you go to the highest point of Earth, and that's Mount Everest. Uh, there's trash laying around up there, used oxygen bottles. Hell, there's dead bodies up there they're finding all the time. You go to the lowest point of the Earth, the Marianas Trench in the South Pacific, and ever since that Fukushima nuclear reactor uh, tsunami deal, I figured there had to be some down in that thing. And guess what? National Geographic did a study a couple of years ago, and they found that the uh, the biological creatures living in the Marianas Trench have been exposed to greater concentrations of pollutants, you know, more pollutants than the worst polluted rivers in China today. And I've been to China a couple times, and, and uh, it's not a, you don't see any wildlife. They don't see any songbirds, let no. alone cats and dogs, you know. So, uh, but that's the legacy. So when we talk about rights, we talk about responsibility, you know, it is our responsibility as sportsmen and women to leave our, our, our woods and our streams and our waters better than we found it. And the, and the North American model is absolutely the greatest model that's ever you know, been, been created for wildlife conservation. We just have to do a better job of educating that 70, 80% in the middle that don't understand why we hunt. We all know why we do, because it's ingrained in us. I mean, there's a reason why you were talking about you know, getting people out and showing them how to shoot and how to fish and you know, how to hunt. Um, there's a reason why I, I don't, you know, let's put this back up here. There's not probably a human being in this world that can deny the statement. Humans, we have to all agree this humans have hunted ever since we've walked on two feet. I don't care what your religion is or your background or, you know, where you come from. I mean, we all can agree on that. Um, but we also, there's a reason why some of these non hunters are find hunting appealing to some extent, or at least have some interest in it. And that's, be, you know, it's like talking about a campfire. There's a reason why a campfire mesmerizes every single human being in the world. And it has absolutely nothing to do with roasting marshmallows. <laughs> nothing. It has to do with the fact that you know, we've been spending the time around a campfire for a long, long, long time here uh, on this planet. So again, we just need to do a better job of educating people about why we're out there in the outdoors, why the North American conservation model and the other models that we do use uh, you know, whether, you know, in Africa, it, you know, Southern Africa uses our model to some extent, but you, the people there own the wildlife, so they do a lot of wildlife farming. But even hunting the, the, the lion or the elephant or something, you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not out there to go hunt those things myself. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not a cheap endeavor, but um, it's not something that really appeals to me. Um, but I have no problem with the people doing it because I kind of liken it to uh, an analogy. I call it the rat analogy. If you have a rat in your house, what do you do? You want to get rid of it, kill it. Kill it, yeah, exactly. All right, so now the same rat's worth $50,000 US. What are you going to do now? I'm going to try to find somebody to pay me so they can have that rat. Exactly. I'm actually going to raise a whole load of rats. <laughs> yeah. So if we want to have a whole bunch of elephants, we want to have a whole bunch of, of Marco Polo sheep or Markor in Asia or uh, big elk. I mean, the model is no different with that. It's about the value. What is the value to our society? Both it has to have an economic model. You know, you hear this. A lot of people say, "If it pays, it stays." Um, that's kind of a cheap way to say it, but the reality is the reality. If here in North America, as a population, that five percent that buy a hunting license fork out a couple billion dollars a year in excise taxes and license fees to pay for conservation, which is the protection of the resource, because you've got game wardens and conservation officers out there. And then you also have the, the biologists doing the conservation, the science. So we, as hunters, pay for that. It's no, nobody else is checking off the $2,500 checkbox on their taxes every year. Oh, I don't want my tax return. Oh, I'm going to give it all to, to the fish and game department here at the state. No, they don't do that. But what hunters and, and sportsmen do is they specifically do that. They spend, they put their money where their mouth is. They go out and pay for these things. They, they care about the resource. They want to spend time in the great outdoors. And that really, I mean, you know, that's why we do what we do. Yeah, we want that food, but we have a connection to the land. I mean, I remember my dad. My dad was a journalist for 30 years. He wrote for Outdoor Life and Field and Stream. And he also wrote for the big newspaper in Detroit when I was a kid. 
and he did a survey about why people hunt. And this is back in probably, I don't know, 1980 or something. So a long time ago, probably before you were even around. And, uh, but the, but the survey was, you know, what are the top 10 reasons why you hunt? And so back in that day, we're talking way before cell phones, emails, the internet. I mean, you got snail mail. That's all existed. And they just started making faxes, I think, about that time, maybe. I don't know. Computers were just starting to come out. But the reality was is there was this, this, this little survey, and you had to cut it out of the newspaper. It was like in the middle of the paper, right where the seam is. They call it the gutter. And you cut it out, and you'd have to fill out your name, and you have to check the top 10 reasons. So all the reasons are there, but you had to go ahead and check them off, you know, 1 through 10. And then you had to fold it up and put it in your own envelope, address it to my old man at the newspaper, put your own stamp on it, and then walk down to the mailbox. Now, in this day and age, nobody, I mean, you wouldn't even get people to read it, you know, if it's not here and there and gone, you know, two seconds. But so, and, uh, and I was like, oh, okay. We had over 40,000 people fill that survey out. And it was amazing. So, like, it sucked for my brother and I, my younger brother and I. Like, every day after school, once schoolwork was done, we had to sit in the living room and tally these, excuse my French, we had to tally these things. And, uh, you know, but it was pretty fascinating because I'll never forget it, to the, you know, for the rest of my life. I mean, the least important reason, I mean, it was one of the least important reasons to actually hunt for people. And we're talking about a lot of people in a state full of, of um, auto workers and whatnot. But, you know, it was actually to kill something. And, but then the number two reason, if I recall, uh, to go out and hunt was to spend time in the outdoors. And the number one reason was to spend time in the outdoors with friends and family, camaraderie. And if you think about why we've historically hunted, why we spend time in the outdoors, it's for those things. Those two top things is, I mean, I, I, I'd much rather spend and you know, share time in the mountains with friends than go out there by myself. And of course, hunting is not backpacking. I mean, yeah, you might be backpacking, but it's not. Hunting is, is, is a whole different thing. I mean, it's a different, it's a different mindset. You know, the hunting is, is out there and preparing and planning and training, um, eating healthy. Um, and of course, the end result is eating extremely healthy because, you know, we're eating or, you know, organic, wholesome, natural proteins that aren't full of, of just, you know, whatever, you know, whatever the, 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 the corporate farms are putting in their stuff so they can increase their share price which I have no problem with, but you would be nice to know exactly what you're getting yourself into. So as hunters, yeah, we, we have to think real seriously about what we're going to leave this planet, how we're going to leave it. And um, the greatest thing we can do is think real seriously about how we communicate to the non-hunting public, share that meat, um, share your experiences, think real hard about posting grip and grin pictures on social media. Uh, you know, the hunting community needs to do some serious soul searching about, um, you know, what, how they want to portray themselves because, um, you know, I kind of liken it to, uh, uh, real estate, 5% of the realtors sell 95% of the real estate and that's because they're good at it. Right. Well, about 5% of the hunters put out 95% of what I consider the crap that we see on social media or YouTube or outdoor television. And, uh, unfortunately it's done a huge disservice, not only for ethical hunters, but it's done a huge disservice to wildlife and wildlife habitat conservation in this country and, and across the world. Yeah. I mean, we have to be conscious of what we're doing and where I'm, I'm not afraid to offend someone. And I know you're not afraid to offend someone in, in the proper way, but there's a difference in saying the truth and, and try to educate somebody. And then if they take it and offended by it, then that's just today. Everybody's offended by everything. But, doing something like, like a big grip and grin blood everywhere. And Hey, look what I just killed. You know, it's like, Hey, I killed something. It's like, you know, for me, I, I, I would rather take a picture of a steak on a plate with my family. Like this is my trophy right here. Like I'm feeding my family with what came out of the woods. And, yeah. and I think that, you know, we, we, we've lost that even as hunters, like we've lost that connection. And, and like I was saying that, like, you know, that, like you're exactly right. It's not a right to hunt. It is definitely a privilege that many of us probably think is a right, but it's a privilege and it's an honor to be able to do that. And meeting you and seeing what you're doing and how you're impacting and how you're just sharing the story from other places, other countries. And, and I want you to talk a little bit about kind of what you're doing and even how, not only the hunting aspect, but how like you, there are, there, you're making bracelets, you're having bracelets out of the snares 
Yeah. And, yeah. and, 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 and cause that is, that's something that, and that here in the States we may not think about, but what you're doing is, is you're helping these people that not only hunting, but they're, you're taking the, the poachers and those who are hurting their economy and their wildlife and doing illegal things. And you're taking all that stuff and turning it into good, which is an amazing thing. And that we may not oh, see yeah. here in the States. And Brooks, and, and so basically to kind of explain to people, so I've been working for four years uh, in a subject area in Zambia, documenting, creating, producing this film, telling the story, as I mentioned earlier, about this, this woman chief, which is, it's rare to have a woman chief in this part of Africa. Uh, and she's literally, I mean, these people are, 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 were starving and they had not had uh, any legal hunting in the area. They live in an area that had been a hunting concession area, but it had been poached out. You know, literally, uh, it had it had the big five in it of Africa, which is your elephant, your lion, your leopard, um, Cape buffalo, uh, and uh, rhino. And so, literally, I mean, it, it was the real Africa. Now, it's not the Serengeti Plains. You know, it's not out of Africa. It's not these big open areas. It's a it's a mountainous bush, Mopani forest habitat with rivers running down through the bottoms of these valleys. But it, it is incredible wildlife habitat. Very few people historically lived there, but there is one population that's lived there. There's about 5,000 today that are in this area. Um, but it's the area that's, I mean, literally the whole valley is larger than Rhode Island. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we're talking a couple hundred, well, a couple, well, two, two and a half million acres in size in the entire valley. And so what happened is um, the chief was trying to get some help. She, you know, her people were starving to death. They're subsistence farmers. Um, they live in so where the soils are substandard soils. Um, they're having problems of rainfall, whether it's global warming or global weather changes. They're not getting the consistent rains that they've had in the past. And you know, since uh, the, you know, since the white man showed up, uh, he introduced maize or corn, which is obviously from the indigenous here in North America. And so there's a you know they have they they just the people there the community people love corn I mean that's a, a staple in Africa now what's it called mealy meal they ground up the corn and they they'll boil up water with it turn it into a porridge and literally they eat it with everything in all their meals um, you know dipping it in with kafu kavui which is a, a plant that they that, that they'll they'll roast up they'll they'll fry it up and they'll put uh, bunch of spices and stuff in it and you'll just you'll just dip you everybody washes their hands and you dip your hand in this thing with this uh, mealy meal and you get some of the some of the cabbage and all this stuff that got spices on it you sit there and eat and you sit around the fire and talk um it's really cool it's a great lifestyle and these people have hunted since the beginning of time also but with uh, with colonialism coming in you know european powers needed resources so back in the you know in the 1800s they, you know, you had the Europeans come down there, and uh, of course the Arabs have been there for a while, and the Portuguese, because they were the propagators of the slave trade. Um, but, you know, that reality is that these people have been on the ground for a long time, utilizing their wildlife resources. But um, in the 1980s, 1990s, this area was known as one of the crown jewels of safari hunting. So it had safari hunting operator and sold hunts for people to come hunt there, and uh, it, it was full of wildlife and very few people. Uh, but in the late 80s, and then again in 2001, 2002, the government banned hunting uh, in the country due to uh, some serious issues with corruption within the hunting community, but also within the government, mostly the government, but with some nefarious uh, characters in the hunting industry. And uh, so because of those bans, the hunting companies, the farming companies, were paying for all the anti-poaching efforts through the sale of, of hunting uh, hunts, you know, and, and trophy fees. So there was nobody on the ground watching anything. And they had an operator in this subject area that literally was just a local guy out of Lusaka, the capital. Um, he wasn't running it. He was running at his own personal deal for him to go out and hunt two or three weeks out of the year, but literally neglected the place the rest of the time and the people. So there was no income coming in. There was no anti-poaching going on. So for about 2000 on, so the last 20 years, almost all the wildlife was completely destroyed through two forms of poaching. Uh, of course, the, uh, the elephants and the rhinos didn't walk away. They were, they were killed for their horn and their ivory. Uh, so all of them were eradicated and killed. And also they cut them up for bushmeat. So bushmeat is, uh, bush is a multi-billion dollar black market industry in Africa. I mean, think about it. Like, you go to Wisconsin, what's the number one snack food there? It, it's, it's processed meat products, jerkies, um, snack sticks, that kind of stuff. Well, the number one thing that people like to eat in Lusaka and a lot of these cities in Africa that they consider a right, wild game meat. 
because they've been eating it forever. So when the colonialists came in, they said, oh, you can't do that anymore. You can't hunt. You can't do there. Only these people stuff. So it totally effed up the whole, the whole program for everybody. And, and they didn't think about what the communities needed. So what we documented was, you know, here's this destruction of the wildlife resource. Incredible habitat. It's still there. Few people, you know, and of course, some of the local community was utilizing this resource to, you know, to the detriment of it. And then they had poachers coming in from outside. They had entire villages that were nothing but poachers that were sitting in the close, you know, in areas where wildlife lived. It'd be like, hey, going down to the wildlife refuge and setting up shop and having an RV camp out there. And every day and every morning, we went out and killed it and ran it to the market and sold it. That's exactly what was going on. So wildlife is denuded. Um, the chief, her people were starving to death. You know, the crops were failing. I mean, they're dealing with all kinds of social problems from uh, disease like uh, the sleeping sickness is a real problem. They have the tsetse fly there, which kills all domesticated animals. So they don't have cows and sheep and stuff. There's a few goats that, that'll survive, but they don't have dogs. They don't have cats because they can't survive. Um, it kills a lot of people, but they have malaria is a big problem. HIV, AIDS, you know, about 10% of the population has that. Uh, and then you're dealing with alcoholism. I think that's the huge, biggest problem I've seen in Africa is alcoholism. Now, remember, Africa is a huge continent. So let me, let me preface that, in Zambia, where I'm at, um, you can put all of North and South America and Europe and India into the continent of Africa. So it's a big place. But um, what this alcoholism is just terrible because you got these guys that are farmers. And then, of course, when they're waiting for their crops to grow, um, they got nothing to do. So they go out and start drinking. And if they can make a little bit of money here and there, they spend it on, you know, on, on booze and, and prostitutes if they've got enough money for it. So there, there's all kinds of problems internally with the people. And, and it even leads to the point where you, you, most of these people are having seven, eight, nine, ten kids, sometimes more than one wife, because they, they go ahead and buy child brides. So for the price of about 30 bags of corn, which will feed your family of eight for the year, you can buy someone's daughter who just, just reached puberty. And so we documented a couple of girls, specifically one gal that was 13 when we got there and she had a young baby already and she was pregnant with baby number two. And uh, it, you know, it's a real sad, sad deal, but it, you know, it's the predicament of what happened when the local population didn't take care of its natural resources. Uh, in this, in this case, the wildlife. So they, the chief went and sought out a guy named Roland Norton, who uh, was in the import export business, was also involved in the hunting safari industry. And, uh, and his son is a full-time professional hunter. And uh, Roland also works as a professional hunter, but he had a business, a regular day job. And uh, she reached out to this guy because she heard he was honest and they needed someone to help them. So the, the Norton showed up. And of course, Roland had hunted this area in like 1989, back in its Valhalla of wildlife. So he knew what it was capable of, but when he went out there, they were shocked. You know, there was nothing there. I mean, they saw tracks here and there, but they didn't see hardly anything as far as wildlife goes. So, but they looked at it and they tried to figure out, of course, there was no hunting quota. It hadn't been for, you know, 15 years, 20 years. So nobody was legally hunting, just poaching. Uh, and so there was no way for them even to bring clients in. So the long and the short of it is they agreed to come in. They signed a contract with the community, with the chief, and also with National Parks and Wildlife, which oversee these, uh, these hunting areas. Um, and they agreed to, you know, try to help these people kind of get the first two rungs up on the, on the ladder to get themselves out of absolute poverty and, and get some food stability. They invested in building a fish farm. They've got uh, six 30,000 gallon above ground tanks. So it's intensive fish farming. Uh, the idea there was even if the fish farm didn't make a profit, as long as it would break even, that would allow them a, a resource for protein for the people. So they've actually restocked the river, which had been poached out because poaching is not only just fit I and mean, just game animals, it's the fish too. And so these people put smaller and smaller nets out in the rivers and they eventually catch all of the brood stock. I mean, there's nothing survives. And uh, so eventually you, they, they had to go back and put fish back in, into these, into these rivers. And then they had this idea because these, some of the villages are pretty remote and scattered. So they started to build another fish farm in another area that had a concentration of people in uh, that had some uh, springs. So they're able to actually manufacture some, some you know, dike uh, impoundments, if you will, or, you know, just you kind of, you know, trout pond kind of thing. But these aren't trout. These are brim and catfish and, you know, tilapia. That's the native fish that they have there. So they got good eating fish. 
And um, so they did that. And then they started building dams in other parts of the communities where they'd go and stock fish in there. And they taught these people to use a, a, a cane and, and a, a, you know, a pole, cane pole type thing with a, with a, with a hook and, and, a, and a line with a piece of bait. And so just go in there and catch a few fish for dinner. Don't catch them all, but just catch a few. So they're teaching about conservation. So, and then, so they started that. And so again, getting food stability, make sure there's protein, um, give people some jobs. There's people there that have never worked a day in their life that have their very first job. And so these people are in their twenties, thirties, 40 years old, have the first job in their lives. Um, you know, it, it created a lot of stability in the community. Um, and then they worked with the, uh, the couple of medical clinics to take the nurses. There's no transportation around there. Nobody has a vehicle. The chief has a vehicle. There's a few other people that might have a vehicle, but I mean, out of five, 6,000 people, there's probably four vehicles besides the safari company. So the safari company would start taking the nurses around from the medical facilities to all to the remote villages and getting the kids um, inoculated, getting their vaccines, getting checkups, that kind of stuff. Government pays for the nurses, so they're able to do that. And then after my first trip there, uh, my father-in-law started a, a charity called African Children's Schools because he'd been in Ethiopia some years earlier and had an epiphany and he says, I got to help these people. So he started building schools in the bush for these remote communities. And today, African Children's Schools, I think has built somewhere around 60 schools in Ethiopia, Uganda, um, South Africa. And now we built three schools, five separate classrooms in Zambia in our subject area, including a house for, for a double, like a duplex for teachers. Uh, and these schools had you know, 80 to 100 kids going to them prior to building them. These were open air, thatch roof, you know, pole stakes schools. And the teachers weren't, you know, real teachers. They were just an adult that had to know something and could actually try to had the time to go out and teach these kids something. So they weren't getting a good education. So since they built these schools, like one of the schools, they're only expecting, a, you know, 80 to 100 kids in it. And it includes, they buy uniforms, they pay the salaries for the teachers, they put the desk in, teaching supplies, all that stuff. Just an incredible godsend for these people. And uh, one of the schools that only had 80 or 100 kids to it, within 30 days of the school opening, they had 400 kids going to that school. I mean, it's just amazing. And the thing that's cool about this, Brooks, is that these kids are learning English. I filmed a classroom of kids doing their ABC singing Old Lang Syne. I mean, it was just, like, just haunting what they were doing and just learning that. And the thing is, it's going to give those kids a chance to understand the whole processes of, of, you know, just learning English, all of a sudden opens up all kinds of doors. But because they understand where this money's coming from, the pay folks is coming from the safari company who's investing their own hard earned personal funds in this. And these aren't rich people. These are people like you or I, if you like you're, you know, somebody's dad, you know, selling his half of the business and, and sticking a half a million dollars into a dream, hoping that it works. Because if it doesn't, then guess what? You're out the money. Um, so it's been real fascinating to tell a story. And of course, this film goes on for four years and we could talk for four years because it is incredible what happens. I'm not going to get you guys into that, but the Bush war going on, it's a shooting war. We were embedded with scouts. We went into confiscation of guns at night. I mean, we pull off the tower road and you hear a chorus of AK-47s rack and load in the back of the land cruiser, all the game scouts just getting ready to go because they've gone into some things and been, you know, and, and basically been lured into some traps in the past. But you know, here I am with a bad camera light on the front of my camera going around in the dark going, where's the guy? Where's the gun? Whatever, you know, I don't know what's happening. Of course, I'm going to be the target when the, when the guns start going off because I got the big old light. But, you know, it's been a fascinating story. And again, it's that story of basic human rights. Will the people, you know, the gentleman, you know, the Blackson was one guy who was a poacher turned game scout and just a phenomenal person. I mean, the guy knows the wild like nothing. I mean, I spent a lot of time with him. Um, and he, and he's just, you know, he's trying to raise eight kids and, you know, and his family. Is he going to have the same right to raise his kids that we have? Or is somebody in New York or London going to tell him that he can't benefit from his work as a game scout, which is, a very small quota of game animals hunted with clients that come in throughout the hunting season, but it generates enough income that pays his salary, pays money that goes to the community, pays money that goes to the chief. And obviously all that money stays in country because the people that are running the operation are Zambians, they're multi-generational Zambians. This money isn't getting shipped off to 
some, you know, some island or Panama. <laughs> you know, it's not going to an offshore account. It's being spent on, you know, the Toyota dealership for parts. It's being paid for fuel. It's being paid for groceries. It's being paid for insurance. It's being paid for construction materials. It's being paid for wages for people. It's being paid, you know, it's helping pay for things at the schools. I mean, there's a whole litany of things that, that comes from you spending $20,000, $100,000 as an American or European going in there to go on a hunting safari. I mean, it's, it's just, it's unfortunate that we have so many forces arrayed against us that want to lie about the realities on the ground. So that's why we made this film, because it is a hard hitting, it, it, a very, you know, I'll, I'll say it's, a, it's probably one of the best productions I've ever produced and directed. And um, the idea is to have that open up doors so that we can get people in London, people in Berlin, or people in Copenhagen, or people in LA, or New York, or Chicago, or Miami, to sit down and watch this film and go, wow, I didn't realize this is what's really going on on the ground. And then hopefully that open up the doors for us to sit down with the media, because, I, you know, the, the reality, the, the, it's the truth. We're not making, we're not making anything up. This is what's going on. And so, you know, we need to make sure that these people have every opportunity to, to do what they need to do to live the life they want. I mean, they're, they live in a sovereign country. Um, they should be making decisions for themselves because they've been there a lot longer than we have. And they certainly know about it. And again, going back to that colonialism, you know, we kind of effed up the whole place. Uh, we came in there to extract the resources that we need because we destroyed all the resources or extracted everything we could there in, in, in Europe. And that's why that happened. Same thing with North America. You know, we came in here for a reason. And it wasn't, you know, some of it was religious freedom, but most of it was monetary. It was economics. And, uh, and that's really what's going on. And the same thing happens in Africa now with COVID. You know, right now, there's, it's basically shut down. You know, some countries have shut down tourism. Most people can't travel, haven't been able to travel since last spring. So that went through the entire safari season, no matter whether it's consumptive uh, tourism or photo tourism. Um, no one's been shown up. So all of these places have no economic resource. It's not like they had a piggy bank sitting out back or they got some big government like printing money like we have in the United States or Europe. These people are really having a hard time. So, you know, our whole goal is to really educate people about that. So the snare bracelets, so I, I was sitting out there about a year ago and they had a whole pile of snares. I mean, they've collected over 17,000 snares in five years just in this one area. And, you know, a snare, for everybody that doesn't understand what a snare is, it's, it's a piece of wire. Not always a piece of wire. It could be a piece of rope. I mean, I've even seen these guys where they get their bags of mealy meal. The bag is got woven plastic is what it is. And they will unweave the plastic bag. Now, this holds ground corn, right? So it's very, very tightly meshed. I mean, it's not that there's no stuff coming out of it. So they untie the meshes or undo them and turn them into little guinea fowl snares because it's about about 10 12 inches of of little plastic you know it's not you know it's just a thin paper looking you know weave and they take them out and they'll put a hundred of these around a water hole to kill guinea fowls but these wires they'll use they'll steal anywhere they can get it from i mean they'll, they'll pull it off of power lines uh, they'll pull it out of buildings um, anywhere they can find wire that they can bend just enough. They want it pretty high tensile strength, but they'll have stuff from thin wire that they'll use for smaller game animals like uh, impala and warthog. And I mean, I've seen warthog that are dead that have a snare wrapped around their face. They couldn't get away. They couldn't drink. They couldn't eat. And they literally starve while well, they, they would have uh, died of dehydration. Just an awful death. But the, uh, one guy, one poacher can put a hundred snares out in a week if he really wants to. And they put them around, they ring water holes. And when they ring these water holes, anything that everything's got to come to drink. So whether it come along the river or come along the spring, something will step into something. And the way it works with antelope species and snares, the males have horns. So when they walk into a snare, almost invariably, that snare and that horn will connect. And it makes a very unnatural sound in nature. So the animals will stop. And usually the males will back themselves out of the snare. Not always, but for the most part they do. Now the females don't have horns. So the females and young, when their neck gets in there and they feel that pressure on that neck, that immediate flight, you know, you know, fight and flight instinct is, is enacted and they, it kills them right there. I mean, literally it's to strangle themselves to death fighting this thing that's around their neck. So what, what happened in the Luana where our target or subject area was entire 
entire generations of animals were erased. The young and females completely killed because of these snares. So different gauges of where, I mean, they make them big enough to catch hippos and elephants with. I mean, and I can't tell you how many animals I've seen when I'm filming wildlife out there that are missing paws, baboons missing a paw, or even a leopard missing a paw, uh, or some other, you know, warthog that's, you know, got a, a snare wrapped around its leg, you know, and it's infected and festering and everything else. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible slow death. And, uh, but it's extremely efficient because the guy doesn't have to put out an awful lot of energy to go out and kill something. He just got to put out a bunch of snares and just check on them once in a while. But unfortunately, in the cases in my, a lot of parts of Africa, including here, sometimes they'll check them, sometimes they don't. And if they don't go back and remove the snares, the snares continue to kill forever. They're indiscriminate killers. So what I did is I saw all of these snares sitting there in a pile. Of course, I said, what do you guys do? They said, oh, we get enough of them or pouring a concrete foundation or something or building a dam for the ponds. We just throw it in the concrete. That way nobody can use it. And I said, well, well I got an idea here. So um, what we've ended up doing was uh, we've got eight women in the community working full time for us. And we've repurposed these snares into bracelets. So for men and women, uh, various different styles. And the idea behind every bracelet that you purchase, that's an animal you saved in the wild in Africa. And so not only do we have these women working for us, but we've also committed to helping fund some other things that they need, scholarships and things like that for women in the community. So if we can sell a lot of these things, these people are gonna see a lot of great benefit, but we're already paying their payroll and, and giving them jobs where there were no jobs really, uh, especially for anything like this. And what we're now trying to do is get people to come to uh, shepherdsofwildlifestore.com and uh, order, order these bracelets because uh, we're using them for a really great cause. And of course, we want to use it also to promote. We've got a section in the movie that talks about the bracelets being built and, and manufactured by these women and what the, the purpose behind it is. And then we hope if the movie takes off, then uh, we'll really start to, to make some inroads and, and get a lot of people excited about wildlife conservation and, and uh, all over the world and, and about doing what's right and, and making sure that people understand that hunting is, uh, is a complex thing, no matter where it is. Um, there's no black and white issue here. I mean, it's, 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 it's very, um, yeah, I guess what I try to say is um, saving animal or killing animals isn't always bad and saving animals isn't always good. So, uh, so that's really in a nutshell what we're trying to do. Yeah. And that's awesome. And the bracelets, you, you know, they, they look amazing. And it's one of the things I was, I was thinking about getting some for, even for my kids, you know, just to, just to hang up and, as a reminder, because I'm always trying to encourage them to be grateful for what we have, but, and, and so that they know that there are places out there that they don't have it as good as we do. And, and I think, you know, especially for, you know, we always want to make it better for our kids than we had it. And, and then I'm always troubled with that sometimes, like, am I making it too easy on them? You know, but I want to, and it's just, for me, having that would be a great way, just a reminder of, hey, like, there are places out there that it's not this good, and we need to be grateful for what we do have and try to give back and do what we can for other people when we have the opportunity, kind of like, you know, what you're doing here. I mean, it's, it's a great thing because you're providing jobs and you're, you're ma it's, it's making a better future for those people. Well, it's not only those people, but for all of us, for all yeah. of humans, because if we don't, do something about this country and about this planet when it comes to our, our resources. I mean, you know, this is not gonna be a good place that we're leaving for our, for future generations. And, uh, you know, we have that responsibility, like I said earlier, to leave it better than we found it. This is just a way that I've been able to use 30 years of filmmaking experience and, and experiences around the world and being blessed to do what we do. Um, it's just a way that I've been able to, to parlay that into something hopefully that will make a difference in the future. Yeah. Well, man, Tom, I really appreciate all that you're doing. And if you would just give us the, the places that we can find more about you, uh, about, about everything that's going on, where we can learn more about the film and where, how we can support and, and, and get a bracelet. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the greatest thing is buy a snare bracelet. You just go to shepherdsofwildlifestore.com. So that's shepherdsofwildlifestore.com. Um, and you can always find me at shepherdsofwildlife.org. Uh, and then I'm always, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. I think Instagram, it's Tom Opry official, uh, Instagram, uh, you can find me as TA Opry or Tom Opry, you know, 
my dad was a writer, as I mentioned earlier, so and I'm a writer too, so I don't, he went by Tom. So a lot of my bylines will be TA, just so I don't uh, get anybody confused. My father, thankfully, is still alive, uh, even though he's well retired. But um, yeah, I, we appreciate what you guys are doing. Anyone that can help, I mean, please come to the website, come to the Facebook page or, or uh, Instagram pages, um, ask questions, ask the help, ask to be a part of it. We're not looking for people to make donations. We're looking for people to make commitments to be a part of something bigger and better and help us and, and, and really make a difference in the future. Yeah, man, I really appreciate it. And please just go check out, you know, all the information that, that's out there about what Tom's doing. Buy a bracelet. And I mean, and, and when the film is available, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to, will we, will we be able to purchase well, the so, film or how's that going to work? So the process with the film is um, we're going through the film festival circuit. So right now, we've, as I mentioned earlier, we've submitted to about you know, almost 100 film festivals. Uh, of that, we'll get selected by a certain number of them. Uh, and then at that point in time, we're also starting to talk to potential film distributors, uh, whether it be a Hollywood studio for a theatrical release or a, a broadcast entity or uh, you know, Netflix or Amazon or somebody like that. Our goal is to kind of get it to the widest audience possible. So then what we'll do is market it. And uh, hopefully within about the next six to eight months, we'll have, a, have it uh, show up either in the movie theaters, if we go back to opening movie theaters, or it will be on some sort of online uh, you know, video platform, whether it be a Netflix or something like that. Uh, that that's our goal with it. And then uh, that's the plan. And then we'll see where it goes from there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Tom, but if you want to keep track of everything we got going on, all you got to do is just follow those dang social media pages because every day we're posting something. I hate social media guys because I got to, I got to spend an hour on it every day, just posting everything because uh, all my board of directors and our media people are like, you must tell the story. So the other thing we're doing just on a quick side note is that I've been asked to write a companion book. So there is going to be a, a book uh, called killing the shepherd. Uh, that'll be a companion to the film. The neat thing about the book is, uh, I'm actually been was writing it before we got on, the, on this call, uh, is that I can tell people a lot more about what really is going on that I can't do in a film. I mean, it's, uh, I, and I have to be careful about certain things. I mean, this is a third world country. Um, people do die, people do die in the film. And um, I have to be careful what I say about certain things because it could have a very, very disastrous uh, effect on certain people's lives. But I mean, it's, it's just so serious as film is. But the reality is we're going to have a book out there. There'll be a little more information about uh, to, to flesh out some more of the subjects. Also, it'll be an enhanced e-version. So you'll be able to watch uh, lots of video in it. There'll be lots of photography. We took Tony Bynum over on our first trip as a world-renowned uh, wildlife and outdoor photographer. Um, so we've got some great imagery. And uh, then there'll be, obviously, there'll be an audio version of it. So uh, by this time next year, there should be all this pumping out. So just stay tuned on social media and, and be looking for Killing the Shepherd and the Shepherds of Wildlife Society. And if you can get over to our website, shepherdsofwildlife.org or shepherdsofwildlifestore.com, then uh, we'd love to see you. Man, thanks so much, Tom. I appreciate you and I appreciate everything you're doing. Hey, everybody, make sure to check it all out and stay humble, be hungry, and get healthy. Hang on the sunshine, bring on.